The Losers was one of my favourite titles when I was first getting into comics, but can it still deliver today? Or was it just a product of its time? Woof woof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus aka The Mad Dog and we're back with another video. Written by Andy Diggle and illustrated primarily by Jock, the first issue of The Losers was published by Vertigo Comics in August of 2003, with the 32nd and final issue being released in March of 2006. And The Losers are dead. At least that's what the CIA believe after the handler Max betrays them for stumbling on secrets that could implicate the USA in war crimes. But with the guy who left them for dead still out there, The Losers want revenge, but what if a fate worse than death is waiting for them? And what if they find themselves on a path that could cause World War 3. Now we're jumping into the art section and the majority of it is done by Jock who's a name that needs no introduction but he does kind of need a bit of an asterisk when it comes to the losers because this is him early on in his career. So although it's not as jarring of a change to me as like when I was looking at Tony Harris and I saw the work that he did in Starman and then I saw the work that he did in Ex Machina and I thought that it was two completely different people, I still do want to point out that the losers isn't the best example of Jock's range. It's still decent enough, don't get me wrong, but if you go into this expecting the exact same level of style as you get in something like Batman the Black Mirror, then you're gonna leave disappointed. Which is a shame because there's still a lot that Jock does really well and the best best example of that is the big action, and for me that's also one of the main selling points for the losers. His blocky, almost 2D like style made it very easy to see what was happening but he still managed to keep that frantic pace. As well there's a lot of scenery changes throughout the losers because they travel across the globe and it was fun seeing Jock capture all these different fields and locations with his minimalistic style. As well for the most part the main characters have a great design, they're all unique and distinct, they're fun to look at but they also remote really well, and the only exception to that would be when a character is massively cloaked in shadow. Now because of where Jock was at in his career, there wasn't any depth to the shadow, it was just a massive wall of black. So if I couldn't see the scar, then Clay and Rock pretty much became the same person. And this was also a problem that I noticed for other characters that weren't the main ones. And especially in a series that had code names, people trying to keep a low profile, and also being under disguise, it meant that parts of this book could get a bit murky. One great adaption of his style though was during the flashback issues. With such a minimalistic look, it was just great that he could still convey a sense of time. Because in those issues, the art would become even more two-toned, the colours would be a little bit flatter and it felt like I was watching somebody's hazy memory. However, whether it's modern Jock or early, there's always something unique about his style. It always feels like his panelling and the way that the subjects are positioned are done so in a way so that it has a cinematic feel. And there's missing backgrounds in certain panels, which is something that I would often scold when I'm doing a review, but here it feels like a stylistic choice. So although I can't say that this is the most impressed that I've ever been with Jock's art, it is still an interesting time. There were also a few fill-in artists here and there, and it was different enough so that you could tell that somebody else had taken over, but it was never so much of a jarring change that it felt like I was reading a different book. It was a nice surprise to see Nick Dragota in here, I loved his artwork during East of West, probably more so than the story itself, and because of that it meant that this did feel like a complete experience, which really helped to keep that momentum going, and the art felt like a welcome return when I jumped back into it because I only really started this series again because I included it in my underrated Vertigo titles. And I can see why some people might not like this style because it is quite simplistic, but I like the levels that it brings to it, and on the slimmest of slim chances that DC ever did print an omnibus of this book, or you just wanted to pick up any others, you could get them from the channel sponsor, Organic Price Books. They've got great packaging, fast shipping, and amazing customer services, and if you use code WOOFWOOF, woof, you'll get $2 off your order. And if you're ordering three or more books and you want them to be delivered together, make sure you use code WOOFWOOF, woof, ship it together for 5% off your entire order. Don't worry, you can just copy and paste them from the description down below, and you can use these codes as many times as you like. Jumping into the story section now, and when I read books for a review, I always try to consider how it must have read when it first came out, but also how it holds up today. And regardless of which way I look at it, I'm surprised that more people don't talk about the losers. Now I can't say that this is a deep series that's going to make you question your own existence and the human condition and the meaning of life, but it is a really entertaining read. From the first issue, the losers is just full steam ahead and I love being thrown into the middle of it. And even if it does feel a bit paint by numbers now, there were still a lot of elements that were introduced at the beginning that kept me guessing. The betrayals and twists would always come at a point in the story when I least expected it, even if the twist itself was a bit predictable, but I'll probably touch on that in the spoiler section. And I guess my point is that for a 32 issue series it really didn't feel that long, and being able to create that type of pace and carry it throughout the majority of the series is a skill that's often taken for granted. Trust me, there are a lot of series that I've read that have sprinted off the starting line but then limped the way over the finish, and I think a large part of that pace is because of the main characters and just how fun they are to follow. Each member of the losers fits into a very clearly defined role, almost to the point of stereotype. You've got the leader, you've got the tough girl, you've got the tech guy, you've got the big dude, and also the guy that just doesn't speak but's really good with a gun. 
but they were all unique enough in personality to make me want to see more of them together. Jensen, Cougar and Pooch were probably my favourites, but there wasn't really a main character that I straight up disliked. And if I did have to have a least favourite member of the team, it would probably be Aisha. And at the beginning of the series, I loved her inclusion because she was the tough badass outsider that was only really working with the losers because the goals aligned at that moment, and no one was ever really sure if they could trust her. And later on, when they revealed more of her backstory, I understood why she was the way that she was. I feel like I said was way too many times in that sentence. But then they do something with her character that has very little shock value, and it made me feel like they took that decision just so that they could have a memorable moment. But I only really remember it for the wrong reasons. And I do think that some characters just overall were written better than others. Because for example, although I did like the mystique that was surrounding Coogs, I did often find myself just wanted a bit more from him. And even Jensen's humour could be a bit grating on occasions. Poochie's motivation I also found to just be a bit textbook. And those moments that we got when the characters weren't with the rest of the crew were probably my least favourite of the series. They were mostly about Pooch and his family life, so at least it was following a character that he enjoyed. And these types of scenes didn't dominate the book, they were quite few and far between. But Diggle just did such a good job of building up this ragtag team that I wanted to spend more time with. So much so that I really enjoyed those few fleeting moments where they might celebrate a minor victory, or they just wouldn't focus so much on the mission, but they would still just be together. Equally as impressive, this series made a flashback arc enjoyable. How often do I get to say that? And the placing that it had within the whole series was great as well. They didn't come too early, but it also didn't overstay its welcome. And it felt like a worthy payoff for some of those questions that I had at the beginning. What did the losers know that caused Max to betray them? And it's an odd comparison, but it reminded me of the flashback episode in Heroes, where it didn't just feel like filler, and it added context to what I already knew, and it also managed to carry a surprise. It was great, and I probably wouldn't have minded a full mini series that just followed the losers before this series began. But what it gives with one hand, it takes with another because the second to last issue in this is mostly just a flashback monologue. And it's the only big example that I've got where the pace is completely derailed. And unlike what I just said about the earlier flashback, this felt like it came way too late in the series. Especially because the losers were already at the climax, it felt like an awful point to insert this story. And there was a massive threat that they were going up against to the point where I didn't care what the backstory was behind it. And I think the reason I didn't care as much about that explanation is because I didn't feel a massive connection to the villain Max. For the most part, he's faceless, a name, a shadow that the losers are just chasing. And the longer that the series goes on, I understand why it couldn't be the case that he just shows up in front of them every couple of issues. But the main problem is that the major threat that he possesses happens before the series even starts. He's already tried to take out the losers and he didn't succeed. And this is a revenge story, and I get that. And if it would have started the book before the betrayal ever happened, then it wouldn't have had that same frantic pace. But it just didn't feel that constant pressure or that sense of urgency to take him out. So in a way, it almost felt like the pace itself was ahead of the plot. And another thing that really rubbed me up the wrong way is that the story would often do a time skip over something that seemed really interesting. There was one moment where the losers were stuck in the middle of nowhere and they didn't have a clue how they could evacuate. And then in the next issue, it was just two weeks later and they were all just safe and sound. The same thing happened in the last couple of issues and I'm not sure if Diggle wanted to end this at 32 issues. And he himself has said that this series wasn't cancelled, but I don't know what the sales figures were like or what was going on behind the scenes. But I just can't see why you'd skimp out on possibly exciting story moments. But whilst I was reading this, I found myself thinking that this title might have done better if it was coming out today. Because the losers are somehow both of its time, but also ahead of it. And yeah, I know that's a really poor way of explaining this. I never said that I was going to give an intelligent answer. But I was a massive fan of 24. Jack Bauer was my spirit animal, and I'll still never forgive them for what they did to Tony. And the losers gave me very similar vibes. But I still feel like a lot of the themes are relevant today, like surveillance, and also just the way that the government can just messes everyone up. And despite what that episode of Rick and Morty might have done, everybody still loves a good heist. Which was probably one of the highlights of this entire series early on when they were trying to get the information out of that building. And there is just a lot to love throughout this. But one of the things that I think would maybe turn people off is just that there's a massive amount of jargon that goes on in this. And there's also just code words for everything. And the longer that the series went on, I kind of asked myself if any words still had their original meaning. As well, towards the end, I felt like it was becoming convoluted just for the sake of becoming convoluted. You don't need to just add in mountains of plot to make it seem like you've got an intelligent boot going on. Because early on, I liked how many different locations the boot took place in and the backstabs that were going on and the layers that went into it, but especially in the second half, it felt like the plot just kept mutating. That's the only word that I can really think for it. So you had different people within the CIA showing up and also code names for those people. Different organisations were getting thrown into the mix. And then the Middle East just got thrown into this because, well, 
Of course he did, it's a spy thriller that took place after 9-11. But despite it maybe losing a bit of clarity along the way, I really like the ending of this. It proper stuck the landing, which is another phrase that I never really get to say in a review. And without spoiling too much, it was great that it didn't really go too much one way or the other. And in some ways I find it to be quite bittersweet, which still felt like an actual conclusion to this story. But I guess I can't really say too much more about the ending without jumping into spoilers. This is your final spoiler warning, so if you don't want anything else ruined, make sure you skip to the final verdict. But I Aisha's betrayal was probably one of the least shocking twists I think I've ever read. She's introduced as someone duplicitous and yes, my dumbass had to Google if that was actually a word. And I felt that she never really tried to connect much with the team and she was always keeping a distance from them unless of course she was sleeping with them. And it's disappointing because it would have been more surprising if she hadn't betrayed them. And I touched on this in the spoiler free section but they really banked on this being a shocking moment. And as a result of that, it just weakened the overall ending for me. They established that her wanting to go after Max and being part of the losers to begin with was because of the issue that she had with her father, and I just wish that Diggle had taken the story in a different direction. I feel like the reveal of Rogue being a traitor actually meant more to this team overall. And another thing about the ending that I'm quite 50-50 on is Coog sacrificing himself and detonating the nuke so that he could take Max with him. Sure, most of the team was already fragmented, some of which were already dead or on the way to death, so it couldn't have been possible for the team to get back together to kill Max, but... That was their goal from the beginning. So with a lot of the ending already being quite bittersweet, I am glad that at least Max met his demise. And more so by the guy who seems to be carrying the horrors of what happened in Pakistan with him the most. But I did want the entire team to be there when Max finally got his comeuppance. If nothing else, so I am glad that Pooch and Jensen got out in the end though and could confidently turn the backs on their espionage life. And even though it meant that some characters had to die along the way, even though they did leave some ambiguity around Aisha's fate, I am glad that it gave me some form of happy ending and more so one that doesn't feel like it would have been impossible possible given the stakes that they were up against. This is my final verdict. And it's weird when you think about some of the series that managed to stand the test of time, but more so when you think about the ones that got forgotten along the way. The Losers by Andy Diggle and Jock isn't one of the greatest comic series that's ever existed, but it is way more than just being one of the many Vertigo titles that falls in the shadow of some of its bigger series. Or worse, yet another comic that's judged by its unsuccessful movie. Andy Diggle and Jock give us 32 issues with an interesting group of characters that are hell-bent on revenge but find themselves caught in the midst of a conspiracy that's way bigger than themselves. And it's damn entertaining beginning to end. Sure, it relies heavily on cliches, and some of the bigger twists within the series can be predicted. The jock who illustrated this isn't the same jock that you would see today, and it was quick to speed through some of the more interesting moments of the series and didn't give it enough chance to breathe. But if comics exist primarily to be enjoyed, then The Losers definitely ticks that box. Thanks to DC Universe Infinite, it is easy enough to read, and the pace is so great that you can complete this in a few sittings. So if you are a fan of espionage action type stories similar to something like Mission Impossible then this would be worth checking out. So with that being said I do feel like The Losers is a title that has something for everybody even if I don't think it's going to top the list of your favourite reads of all time. So because of that and the enjoyment that I had whilst I was reading this I'm going to give it a very humble score of 70%. Woof woof. So that's the video and hopefully you enjoyed it but until next time just make sure that you stay safe and stay mad all you dogs. Woof woof. See you at the next video.